Okay, so, uh, so today then, let's have a look, make a start then. So what we're looking at today, remember, is um, differentiation methods. Uh, and then next week, we're going to look at integration methods, review that. Best way to do it is by looking at the example. And the example is in the textbook. You would find it if you looked at the textbook. Ah, hang on. Let's unfreeze the page. Um, if you look at the textbook, you would see this example we're going to look at. But don't worry about looking at it in there, Let's, because it's actually one of the worked examples. So as we've done before, before uh, you can look at how they do it and compare it with how we do it and things like that. So what the problem is, is determine the turning points on the curve y equals 4 sine x minus 3 cos x in the range x equals 0 to x equals 2 pi radians. Distinguish between them. Are they maxima, are they minima? And then once we've done that, try and sketch the curve over one cycle. So we've done this before. We did it last year for the BTEC. What sort of steps are involved with this? Let's see if we can remember and write down the steps and then carry them out. Sorry? Yep, finding the method maximum minimum. So what's the first thing to do? Step one. Differentiate. Differentiate. You're confusing that with integrating between the two limits. We're just differentiating here. Why do we differentiate? Right, because we find the gradient to or the rate of change. To find the gradient. rate of change. And why are we interested in finding the gradient or the rate of change? Right, because we want to find the function we want to find the point at which that gradient is zero because at those points the curve max maxes out or we get a minimum. Okay? So that leads us to step two which is step two, Nathan. Um. Once we've differentiated these function, why do we differentiate it? Because we want to find the gradient or the rate of change. And Kenny just said we're interested in... Right, so what do we do? What's step two? Find the points at which... Right. The differential is zero. limited range to this thing. What I need is a nice... Um, yeah. Anyway, right. Okay. Do that. Now we want to find out, we found the point at which it's zero, we want to find out whether it's a maximum or a minimum. Can you remember what we do to find that? just said what does it say right Carol you find the second differential because
Can you remember? It's going to go again, isn't it? You can see it's going to get looped underneath there and it's going to pull off. Never mind. Anybody remember? Find the second differential. Um, that's correct, yeah. So negative second differential implies ah oh, 50 50 chance maximum yeah a positive second differential implies a minimum so once we found those points we find a second differential at those points maximum if it's negative minimum if it's positive so now we can find out where those points are and what the nature of those turning points is And those, those are the steps we use to apply this, uh, this differential calculus in this particular case to find maximum linear values, those three steps, one, two, three. In addition to that, we've been asked to find, um, to sketch the curve. So we might also want to find out points at which the curve crosses the x-axis when y equals zero. Okay in the original function so you can find out where it cuts the y-axis find the points of maximum minimum and then we can sketch the curve that's the plan okay All right nathan so let's let's do it then step one what's the original function y equals four sine x minus three cos x Okay, differentiate it. Notation. Right. Notation first, dy by dx. Yep, sine becomes cos, so 4 cos x. Right, cos becomes minus sine, so minus cos becomes sine plus 3 sine x. Differentiated it, that's step one. That's nice and easy, wasn't it, Nathan? And what's step two? What's step two? We find the point at which that equals zero, right. So 4 cos x plus 3 sine x equals zero. So step two, oops, So what can we do to try and find out what those values are, what those points are? Again. Well, we've got first of all we've got to find the zero points that we've got to find the values of x so that four cos x plus three sine x equals zero. Well, we, because this is zero we can divide or multiply both sides by anything we like and that right hand side will still be zero. So if I divide the left hand side by four, or even three over four, sine x still equals zero, then what can we do? Uh, well, so 
No, then we have, we'd end up having it on here, wouldn't we? Yes, that's right, on the POSIX. We could uh, bring the sine x over the other side. So cos x equals minus 3 quarters sine x, and then we've got to find the values of x that satisfy that. Okay. Ah, no, probably an easier way to do it than that, actually thinking about it. What trig relationship could be handy here? If I were to divide both sides, say, uh, at this point here, instead of doing this, so if we... Well, we can carry on from where we are. If we divide both sides by cos x, we get uh, cos x divided by cos x equals 1 equals minus three quarters sine x over cos x which is tan that's the trig relationship that's handy here sine x over cos x is tan x so using that relationship we can replace sine over cos with tan minus three quarters tan x what might we do now yep so if we times both sides by say negative four we get negative four equals three tan x then divide both sides by three we get negative four over three equals tan x and then what now we need the calculator what step did you take from minus three four to the minus four multiply both sides by minus four to get rid of that minus four on the right so now we need to find negative the inverse tan of negative four over three if we look back at the original question the original question asked us to do it within certain limits uh, between naught and two pi radians so you need to be in radians on your calculator so what's the x equals the inverse tan of negative 4 over 3 which is negative 0.93 radians yeah no exactly it's not within our range right so but this isn't within our range if you think back back to the original problem our range is between 0 and 2 pi radians so it's negative 0.93 but this is a cyclic uh, function isn't it so all we need to do is find the value that gives us negative 0.93 for x between the range that we're interested in so what we need now is the tangent function plotted out so if we go to autograph and plot that out we could sketch it but let's go to autograph and see what it looks like you probably got in mind already what you're expecting to see So I'm in radians and I'm going to type in y equals tan x. There's the function and I'm interested in between 0 and 2 pi. 2 pi is about 6, something like that, isn't it? So if I shift this along here, around about here, and let's put this in.
to our notes and there it is so um, around about here is positive one around about here is negative one and if we look at what we've got at the end of step two here we've got a negative 0 0.93 so that's virtually negative negative one so going back to here again we're around about here somewhere negative one um, so what we need to do is to look down to here yeah down to here and across to this point here and find that but what's the cycle what's the what's this point here further on than this yeah but what do you reckon that is Kenny exactly it's just over three pi exactly Zach that's pi so it looks like it's going from naught repeating in intervals of pi which is the tangent does so what do I do to get from this value to this value add pi so what's negative 0 0.93 plus pi so for our range add pi to get x equals negative 0 0.9 whatever it was 93 was it plus pi which is sorry 2.2 well yes that's right I mean is there another one within our range of 0 and 2 pi here that's less than 2 pi isn't it so as well as this value we can do we've got this value now but we also have this value we want so what do I do to get that value add pi again right so adding pi again we get x equals 2.2 .2 or what's 2.2 .2 plus pi 3.3 so two values of x yeah two values of x that satisfy this this criteria okay those two points the rate of change of the function drops to zero the differential drops to zero at x equals 2.2 or x equals 5.34 within our range of 0 and 2 pi so we have to think about the range that you're interested in in any question or any engineering scenario that involves a trigonometric function which this original function did look I mean we would be able to sketch this it's some sort of cyclic function, a combination of sine and cosine functions so you need to specify the range over which you're interested because this is an infinite function it goes on and so we which range are we interested in so we set the range and we come up with the values and here we are okay so that's step two done step three second differential right step three so we've got that dy by dx equaled if we look back uh, 4 cos 3, 4 cos x plus 3 sin x So what we want now is the second differential d2y by the x squared and what do we get now? Four minus sine x. Yep. 
negative 4 sine x because cos becomes minus sine plus 3 cos x. So now we substitute in our values for x. So for x equal to 2.2, the first one we had, put that in here, d2y by dx squared is, and then we can just put in the value, negative 4 sine 2.2 plus 3 cos 2.2. We're only interested in whether it's positive or negative. Are you working it out, Callum? Uh, negative, five. negative five. So it's negative, which makes it a maximum. And then we put our value of x equals. 3.5.34 was it? Yeah, x equals 5.34. Yeah, and now we're putting that value into sine and cosine functions. So d2y by dx squared equals negative 4 sine 5.34 plus 3 cos. 5.34 and it equals 5 so it's positive so it's a minimum so now we know that there's a maximum occurring when x equals 2.2 and the minimum occurring when x equals 5.34 So sketching the function. There's a maximum when x equals 2.2 and a minimum when x equals 5. Point three four. So we can put those values in. We could do what we could do is working out what those uh, points are. So how can we find out the value of the function? Remember the original function, y equals what was it? Sorry. Minus three cos x. So we can do with putting those two values into this function to find out the value of y at those points. So then we can put them on the curve. So when x equals 2.2, y equals, yep, keeping to radians, yeah. For sine 2.2 minus 3 cos 2.2 5 so we know y equals 5 when x equals 2.2 and 5.34 yeah. Yeah. Will they always be opposite to the second 
In situations like this, yes, because if you look at this original function, y equals 4 sine x minus 3 cos x, uh, then it's going to be symmetrical about the x-axis. If this would have been y equals 4 sine x minus 3 cos x plus a constant state, then that would have shifted the whole thing up or down. And so then you wouldn't have had it symmetrical. But in so it, except for situations where you've got some sort of constant, yes, because that's symmetrical about the x-axis. Um, okay, so now... Say that again, can you? Right, right. Luckily, the microphone didn't catch that. That's all right. So, um, right, now we need to sketch the function. So, we could do with where this function crosses the x axis now, couldn't we? So, we could do we're looking at the original function and finding the points at which this x equals zero, yes. And again, manipulating this function so that we've got um, <coughs> x. So taking the original function to find the points at which it crosses the y-axis, or the x-axis, rather. So to sketch the curve, we also need... points where the curve crosses the x-axis. In other words, when y equals 0. So the original function, y equals 4 sine x minus 3 cos x equals 0. Done that correctly, y equals 4 cos x, 4 sine x minus 3 cos x, yeah, equals 0. So again, we manipulate that, we want to just do that, similar to what we've just done. You again, you're going to get the tan function, so rearrange this, and so you end up with tan x equals something, and then you can work out what x is, following similar steps to. Is that not the same as what we just did? Yeah, very similar. It might not be exactly the same because that was the differential and so we had, I think we had positives, didn't we? So it won't be exactly the same, Zach, but work it through. This is? We're now rearranging this original function and finding where that equals zero, not the differential, which is what we did in step oh, well, one. Yeah. Yeah. It just so happens for this function, because it's sine and cosine, it's almost the same, isn't it? They just swap over, basically. So what do you get up? What do you end up with? First step. And you end up with 10x equals 3 quarters. So x equals the inverse tan of 3 quarters, which is sorry, 0.64. That only gives us one value of x, so of course, and there's many values of x. So, yeah, going back to this tan function again that we had written up here, look, 0.64 is going to be about here somewhere. And so we, within our range of 0 and 2 pi, we could also do with this value here, couldn't we? There's, there isn't another one because that's beyond our range over here somewhere. So we want... We've got that one, and we want this one. So again, yes, add pi to get our other value.
And within our range, x also equals 3.14 plus 0.64, which is 3.78. So we've got zeros when x equals 0 0.64 and x equals 3.74. And we've got a maximum at um, when x equals 2.2 and the minimum when x equals 5.34. And we know what those are. So we can sketch the curve. Would you like to just quickly sketch it? Put those points on and then sketch the curve in between. It's a combination of sine and cosine function, so it's going to be of that form. And then we'll put it into autograph and see if we're anywhere near right. Would you not want the y-intercept? Uh, we could do. Well, if when x equals zero... Yeah. We could also find the y-intercept. When x equals 0. So y equals uh, 4 sine 0 minus 3 cos 0. Uh, no calculators allowed. What's the sine of zero? zero? What's the cosine of zero? What's the cosine of zero? One. So y equals negative three. So yes, Kenny, a good idea. The y-intercept is negative three. So we've got another point we can put on our curve. It cuts the y-axis at negative three. Y-axis at negative three. So sketching the curve... Yeah, y axis, so it's at zero, yes. Okay. X, we're going up to about five point something, aren't we, on the x axis? Is that right? Right, so one, two, three, four, five, six on the x axis. And we're going to negative three, so one, two, three. In fact, we're going to negative 5 and up 1, 2, 3, 4. That's a shame. Didn't do that very well, did I? Make it go in twos. 2, 4, 6, negative 2, negative 4, negative 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we put our points on. It cuts at negative 3. What, that's it, this point here? Yeah, yeah. yeah and then 5 at about 2.2, .2, so it's about here somewhere. And then comes back down, cuts the y-axis at... 3.78, somewhere around here, and then goes down to negative 5 at 5 point something, isn't it? Right. So I think we could sketch that in, couldn't we? Let's use this pretty green colour. Okay. Um, let's use autograph just to do this. Put the original function in, compare it. Comparing this with autograph then. So let's close this one. Open a new page. Enter the equation y equals 4 sine x minus 3 cos x. I think that was right, wasn't it? There it is. 
and we want are interested in it between 0 and 2 pi so around about here Okay. Comparing this with our sketch, cuts at negative 3, goes at 0 0.64, maximum value of 5, guys, maximum value of 5 around about here somewhere. And so, okay, so we sketched our curve pretty accurately. Okay. So we can use this to predict the way functions are going to describe, to, to behave. You wouldn't necessarily sketch out the whole curve, but you might be interested in max and values, because if I've got a, a function with a combination of sines and cosines in, and we've done some work on combining waves, and the peak value of 5 comes from the idea of Pythagoras, if we think back to that idea, okay, so 3, 4, 5 triangle, we had a one wave, a sine wave with a maximum value of three, cosine with four, or I think it's the other way around, but gives us a maximum value of five because of that. That's something we did at B tech level. Um, we can find out where those peak values would occur. So this could, well, x axis could be a time axis, so we can find the time at which this thing will peak by just using it as a calculus. Okay. Okay. Any questions on that one? No. Nope. If you always use um, if you're using a cosine on the side, if you always use um right angle triangle to work out high bottom is is that always using that to be on Yeah, if you're using a, a combination of sines and cosine waves, yeah. So long as the frequency is the same. And in this case they were because it was just sine x and cos x. So we're combining two waves effectively. Remember what x stands for, it stands for the angular velocity times the time in this sort of wave. So angular velocity is related to frequency, so therefore, yeah, so long as you've got the same frequency, yes, it, that applies. Okay, so looking back, these steps are the ones you need to get and you'll be asked to do in your assignment to think about, okay? Applying these steps. If I want to find maximum minimum values, step one, step two, step one, differentiate, step two, let that equal zero. Step three, going back to the original slide, find the second differential to identify whether we've got a maximum or min. Okay? Okay. One other thing I wanted to look at today and that was trying to, if we go back to our original aims, apply this to a practical problem. So there's a few examples in here, practical problems you can try and solve. Okay, so let's have a look at one. Again, it's one I picked out the textbook. Here it is, work problem 20. Let's look at it. Find the diameter and height of a cylinder of maximum volume which can be cut from a sphere of radius 12 centimetres. So, if we look at this cylinder that's been cut from here, uh, what I'm going to try and do is I'll use my pen on this so you can see it in the notes. So, focusing in, around here we've got the cylinder, the, the sphere from which we're cutting this um, cylinder. So, this point going around the sides of the sphere here. And if we look inside here, we've got a cylinder. There, 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 and there are the points of the cylinder. And you can see the base of the cylinder sketched out here. Okay. And the top of the cylinder sketched out around here. Now, I could move this point Q up here towards this point, which would mean this point here would move up as well. And these, these points down here would move to make the cylinder taller and narrower. So by moving this point Q around the side of the sphere, 
I'm going to get the changing volume for the cylinder and I'm after the point at which I get the maximum volume. And so the point of maximum volume, if I were to plot a graph of volume of cylinder versus, say, the height of the cylinder, I'm looking for the point at which I get the maximum volume. A maximum value, differentiate it. So we're going to use these steps. Differentiate, find the point at which that differential is zero. Identify whether it's a maximum or a minimum to get the maximum volume for this cylinder that I can get from this sphere. But before I can do that, I need a relationship. So this is the difference to the one we've just been looked at. In the first example, you're given a function. In this example, you're given a practical situation. So you've got to come up with the formula that relates the volume of the cylinder with the height in relation to this diagram we have here. So let's have a look. There's two... Um, things worth noticing here. One is that if we look at the, the position, the points O, P and Q, right it's a right angle triangle. Yeah, P is around about here somewhere, so we've got a right angle triangle here. So Pythagoras comes in, because this distance here is the radius of the uh, cylinder, PQ, OP is the height of the cylinder, is half the height of the cylinder because it's taken from the center of the sphere, and R is the radius of the sphere. So we can from that get some sort of relationship between the sphere, which is a radius of 12 centimeters, and our cylinder and its height and the radius of the cylinder. So from Pythagoras, what can we write? Uh, sorry? Did you, did you not leave out the squared bit, Kenny? Oh, yeah, the yeah. Right, so the height of our cylinder over 2 squared plus, which is OP, plus the radius of my cylinder squared equals 144. So that's a bit of information we can write down. Right, Zach? See where that comes from? From that yeah. diagram? Yeah. We also have the general formula for the volume of a cylinder. And what's that? Pi R squared. Right. This formula here is the key one because we want to find the rate of change of volume with height. We are after the rate of change of volume with height. Or radius. It doesn't matter. Ah. What notation would I use for the rate of change of volume with height? D. Right. We're after that. So we've got a function here, which is the um, rate of change, or the volume of the cylinder, and we want the rate of change of volume with height. What's the problem with this formula? Not this, no, not that. Two variables. The problem with this function is I've got two variables, the radius and the height. So in problems like this, what I need to do is to get rid of one of the variables by substitution. So we need another piece of information. Luckily, we have at the top. If I rearrange this slightly for r squared, r squared equals 144 minus h over 2 all squared, I can plug that in instead of r in here, and then I'll just have one variable. Okay? So let's call this equation 1 and call this equation 2, and we can say from 
one. A hundred and four. What do we want to write? We want to write r squared. R squared equals one hundred and forty-four minus h over two, all squared. Uh, no. If I square it this, I, I've got. I can't. I've just got to square it the whole lot. I can start square it each one individually, Kenny. Yeah. Yeah. Substitute into two. We've got the volume equals pi times the radius squared, 144 minus h over 2 all squared times the height. Now we've got one, just one variable, height. So we can differentiate it. But I suggest we tidy it up a bit first by multiplying out the brackets. Uh, so we get two terms that when we can differentiate each term separately. Okay? So what would you do with this? Hundred forty four pi H. Minus, let's call that h squared over 4, so that would be pi h cubed over 4, wouldn't it? That becomes h squared over 4 times by pi times pi h becomes h cubed over 4. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Now I differentiate. To complete step one, so we're going to now try and find this maximum volume. So step one, differentiate. Step two, let that differential equal zero and find the value of the height that satisfies that. Once we've got the height, we can plug that back into formula number one to get the radius and once we've got the radius and the height we can put those values into formula two and get the volume and we've got the maximum volume of lots. Would you like to have a go? And then we'll have a look at it together on the board. So I'll give you five or ten minutes just to have a go at that. Step one, differentiate. Step two, let that equal zero. Step three, you can do to confirm that that's a maximum value. Confirm that gives you a maximum volume by differentiating again and confirm that that's a negative value. <coughs> and then that will allow you to find H, from which you can find R. Have a go. I'll just pause this. Yep. Okay, so to solve this then, let's take this function. Uh, paste. Uh, oh, there we go. There it is, right. So let's take that original function, step one. Nathan, you can tell me what step one is at least. Right. Matthew, you can differentiate that for me, can't you? dv by dh, which is the differential of v with respect to h, is... ...144 pi because the h disappears, minus 3 pi h over 4 squared, right. That's step one done. Did I? Yeah, right, <laughs> Step two, Zach. Step 
Right. One hundred and forty four pi minus three pi h squared over four equals zero. Yep, now what have we got to do? Move one to the other side. Yep. So one hundred and forty four pi equals three pi h squared over four. Please don't do that, guys. I'm trying to do some maths here. Times the other side by four. Yep, times both sides by four. What do I get? Which is? Sorry, five, seven, six, pi. Five. Equals three pi h squared, yep. And you can divide by three. And pi. Yeah. So h squared equals five, seven, six, pi. Over three pi, pi's cancel. Yeah, and what does h equal? Square root of one seven six over three. Five seven six over three, which is. Sorry. Which is. Thirteen point eight four. Don't forget, whenever we square root, it can be positive or negative. But we're not interested in the negative value. Why not? Right. Thirteen point eight five six. So okay, thirteen point eight six say. Ignoring the negative value. So the height thirteen point eight six centimeters. I think we're working in centimeters. Now we've got that, what do we do next? All right, so All right, so substitute into one to find R. And what was one? Subject one to find R. That's a, an R underline, that is Nathan. An R underline. Do you rearrange R which is what you got previously? So thirteen point eight six over two squared plus R squared equals hundred and forty four. So R hundred and forty four minus Which equals what? Um, 9.8 centimetres to two significant figures. So R is the square root of that, and again we would ignore the negative value. That is, is it? Right, so R equals 9.8 centimetres. So now we can find the maximum volume because we now know R and we know H. So finally, the volume equals pi times the radius squared, which is 9.8 times 13.86, which is... Yeah.
4,181 cubic centimeters of volume. Volume is Yeah, volume just the volume is measured in cubic centimeters. Q. Oh, is that right? I didn't see that. Hang on. Okay. No, it's not, no. What we could do at this point, couldn't we? Okay, so we've now used this differential calculus to solve a problem, okay? A practical problem, and you can have a go at some in the textbook. The main difference between this and the first type of problem that we looked at, let's go back to the beginning and look at our aims with for today. First one was just to review the main ideas of finding turning points of a function, given function. The second one was to apply this method to a practical problem. What's the main difference between these two things? We look at the first one. Determine the turning points on the curve for this function. Let's look at the second example. Find the diameter height of a cylinder of maximum volume which can be cut from a sphere of radius 12. What's the main difference in this problem and the previous one? In the previous one, you're given the function. In this one, you're not. You've got to come up with the function, okay? And it generally involves more than one variable, and you then have to use this idea of substitution to get a function here that just involves the variable that you want, that you're interested in, in this case, the volume, with one other variable, so we can then differentiate that volume with respect to that variable. Okay. Right. In the textbook, you can see where I got this problem from. If you've got the old textbooks around about page 410, and it go, works through that problem. In the new textbook, what page are we on, Sean? 433. If you look at exercise 162, or in the new textbook 171, so we can have a look now at so look at exercise 162, page 410, in the old textbook, or 171, page 433. <coughs> yep, yeah. in the new text. And what I will do is I'll put this um, up on the board so you can have a go at it. So there's the first three problems, and I'll just, um, in fact, what I'll do is, I'll uh, put these in the notes so I can put both pages on at the same time. So if I now shift this around a bit, do this. So that's that one. And then if I go back to here, Go on a page. Yeah, I'll 
There you go. 